we are now looking at exhibit 21 from the curriculum this exhibit highlights questions that we as financial analysts must ask when we are evaluating the financial reporting quality of a company I'd like you to read through this exhibit it has been reproduced over here I'll simply highlight a few items that I feel need explanation the first one is this concept of channel stuffing which falls under revenue recognition if you believe that a company is engaging in channel stuffing that would be a warning sign this would imply that a company is trying to be too aggressive in recognizing revenue channel stuffing is the practice of overloading a distribution channel with more product than it is normally capable of selling imagine that you are evaluating a company that manufactures washing machines this company sells through let's say a major retailer if the washing machine company is pressuring the retailer to purchase more washing machines than can be sold in a particular period then we might believe that channel stuffing is taking place to evaluate whether channel stuffing is happening we can look at whether special discounts are being offered or whether the company is threatening to increase prices in the later period if channel stuffing does happen then the risk is that the washing machines being sent to the retailer or being sold to the retailer will not be sold to the end customer these washing machines will be returned and then that will have a negative impact on earnings in the future another item that I'll emphasize is bill and hold transactions this is where a company bills the customer and recognizes revenue but doesn't ship the product this would also be an example of very aggressive revenue recognition here are some items related to long-lived assets and depreciation policies the bullet points are self-evident next group has to do with intangibles and capitalization policies again this material is self-evident and has been covered in other readings allowance for doubtful loans and loan reserves companies might not be making the appropriate allowance for doubtful accounts and this can create problems a simple example is that let's say in a given period based on past history the allowance for doubtful account should be 3% but to boost numbers the allowance being used is 2% this would be a cause for concern as analysts we need to understand whether such a change is justified inventory cost methods I want you to read through this tax asset valuation accounts we've talked about this in the reading on income taxes the major point is this when a company reports a deferred tax asset we as analysts need to be aware of whether it is likely that this asset will be realized or not if a company is reporting a large deferred tax asset which expires in three years and during these three years it's unlikely that the company will be profitable then there is a big question as to why this deferred tax asset is being shown I also want to emphasize this last bullet which says the following look for changes in the tax asset valuation account if you recall from the reading on income taxes a company might show a deferred tax asset let's say that the deferred tax asset is 100 and then if this deferred tax asset might not be used we have a concept of a valuation allowance let's say that the valuation allowance is 80 which means that the net effect for the deferred tax asset is 20 the example given here is 100% reserved which would mean that the valuation allowance is actually also 100 then optimism increases whenever an earnings boost is needed by optimism increasing this optimism is in quotes so if you think about it one way to boost net income is to lower the valuation allowance if the valuation allowance goes down from 80 let's say to 70 
then the deferred tax asset goes up. If we have a lower valuation allowance, that is essentially a lower expense and that is positive news for net income. So one way to manage net income is through the valuation allowance and this would be difficult to detect. So it is a method that companies might use to manage earnings. So read through the comment on goodwill. This is self-evident. Warranty reserves. Read through this. This is self-evident also. In terms of related party transactions, we should look at whether the company is engaged in transactions that disproportionately benefit members of management. Does one company have control over another company's destiny through supply contracts or other dealings? If this is the case, then that should raise some additional questions and a financial analyst should probe into exactly what's going on. So far, we have talked about several ways in which financial statements and financial results can be manipulated. Broadly speaking, when we talk about manipulation, we will either have biased revenue recognition or we might have biased expense recognition. The next question is, what are the different kinds of biases? And here again, when we talk about biases, we could either have a bias in timing or a bias in location. A bias in timing would involve either recognizing an expense or recognizing revenue earlier than we should or later than we should. Bias in location would mean that a particular revenue or a particular expense is not shown where it should be. Take a particular expense, for example. This expense could be shown in the income statement as an operating expense, or what management might try to do is show this expense as a component of other comprehensive income. So this is manipulating the location. Other examples of manipulating the location happen with the cash flow statement where a particular operating cash outflow is shown rather than another example is with the cash flow statement where a particular cash outflow should really go under cash flow from operations but is depicted instead as a cash outflow from investing. What we'll now look at is the set of items that you as an alert financial analyst need to be aware of or that you need to look at to try and detect these major warning signs. The biggest one is revenue. Revenue is the largest item on the income statement and several studies have shown that most manipulation is related to revenue recognition. Therefore, what you should do is examine the accounting policies note for a company's revenue recognition policies. In the disclosures made by a company, there is going to be a segment where the company talks about how it recognizes revenue. So when you read this note, here are the things you need to think about. You need to consider whether the policies that the company is stating make it easier to prematurely recognize revenue, such as recognizing revenue immediately upon shipment of goods, or if a company uses bill and hold arrangements whereby a sale is recognized before goods are actually shipped to the customer. So that's an important item to look at. Does the company use bill and hold or does the company recognize revenue immediately upon shipment? These would be examples of overly aggressive revenue recognition. You need to look at whether any sort of barter transactions exist and how revenue is recognized for them. You need to look at whether there are any rebate programs and if so, do the rebate programs involve any estimates including forecasts of the amount of rebates that will ultimately be incurred. We've talked about this several times but there might be multiple deliverable arrangements of goods and services and you need to look at whether it is clear as to how the revenue will be recognized for these multiple deliverable arrangements.
if you feel from the disclosure that the company is getting a lot of flexibility in terms of when to recognize revenue, then that will be a warning sign. Next, it's important for you to look at revenue relationships. And there are several important revenue relationships. A big one is that you should compare a company's revenue growth with its primary competitors or the revenue growth relative to the industry in which this particular company is operating. When you do the equity component of this course, you will study a concept called a peer group, which is the set of companies that are most comparable to the company that you are evaluating. So you need to look at the revenue growth of the peer group on average relative to the revenue group of this particular company. If the company that you are evaluating is showing unusually high revenue growth relative to the peer group, then that will raise some questions. You need to determine whether this unusually high growth is coming because of some strategic advantage, some competitive advantage, superior management. So there needs to be a good explanation, a logical explanation for why this extra growth is taking place. If there is no logical explanation, then that will be a cause for concern and that in of itself will be a potential warning sign. You should also compare the accounts receivable with revenue over several years. There should be a certain stable relationship between the amount of receivables and revenue. If receivables are increasing relative to revenue, then that might raise some questions. That might suggest that maybe credit terms are being relaxed. That might also suggest some form of bill and hold practices or even possibly channel staffing. You should look at the receivables turnover, which is sales over average receivables. And then you should also look at the days sales outstanding, which is the number of days in the period divided by the receivables turnover. If there are any unusual changes in these numbers, that would be a warning sign. Also consider the asset turnover. This is the revenue divided by total assets. The asset turnover gives a sense for the efficiency of the assets. If you notice that the asset turnover is coming down, that would imply that the usage of the assets is becoming less efficient and that might be a warning sign of potential asset impairment. For many companies, especially in the manufacturing sector, inventories represent a major item on the balance sheet and the cost of inventories or cost of goods sold is one of the largest items on the balance sheet. For such companies, you need to pay careful attention to signals from inventories. There are several things you can look for, but the major ones are shown right here. Look at whether there is any growth in inventories relative to the competition or relative to the peer group. If the company you are evaluating has a rapid growth in inventories, and here again, you really need to be looking at inventories relative to total assets. So if a particular company's inventories are growing at a faster rate than the growth rate for other comparable companies, that will be a cause for concern. Perhaps inventory is becoming obsolete. Perhaps the sales are not as much as they should be. So this is something that needs to be explored. You should also look at the inventory turnover ratio, which is COGS over inventory. If this ratio is declining, that possibly might mean that inventory numbers are rising, which might also be a signal that inventory is becoming obsolete. US GAAP allows companies to use the LIFO method for inventory. This is something that needs to be looked at carefully, especially in an inflationary environment. If we do have an inflationary environment, then you need to look at whether a company is selling inventory that was purchased some time ago. In other words, if we are using last in first out and LIFO liquidation is taking place, that means that low cost inventory is being sold, which makes gross profit margins look unusually good. The next item has to do with capitalization policies and deferred costs. You need to carefully study the company's capitalization policy with regards to long-lived assets. 
and the policy with regards to how costs are deferred. You need to consider how a company capitalizes interest, if at all. And then these policies need to be compared with the competition. If there is a major difference between the policies of the company that you are evaluating relative to the competition, then that should be a cause for concern. Pay attention to the relationship of cash flow and net income. The simplest thing to do here is to look at the ratio of cash generated by operations or CFO divided by net income. On average, this ratio should be roughly one. If this ratio is consistently less than one, then that might be an indication of aggressive accounting whereby net income is shown higher than what it should be. Here are some other warning signs that you should be looking for, something that keeps coming over and over. Evaluate the depreciation method and useful lives. Compare this with the competition. If things are out of line, then that would be a warning sign. Fourth quarter surprises. If a company is operating in a non-seasonal business and in the fourth quarter it is routinely overperforming or underperforming, that would be a cause for concern. Presence of related party transactions. Sometimes with a company where if the founding fathers or the founding family is still heavily involved, there is a potential that this family also has ownership stakes in other companies and in order to possibly manipulate the numbers and have better earnings than and to potentially report biased earnings there might be some related party transactions so you as an analyst need to carefully evaluate whether these related party transactions are taking place and what is the intent behind these transactions non-operating income or one-time sales included in revenue one way for a company to boost its revenue is to include non-operating income and one-time sales so while it is acceptable to have these as part of revenue but when you do your analysis and when you are concerned about the persistence of revenue and the persistence of earnings these numbers need to be backed out classification of expenses as non-recurring this has to do with the location bias if an expense is classified as non-recurring, then potentially what a company might be trying to do is understate the operating expense. Very often, we as investors are primarily concerned with the operating results of a company. So companies recognize that and might show certain expenses that really should be operating, but a company might classify them as non-operating or non-recurring. Gross operating margins out of line with the competitors or with the industry. This is something we've talked about. If a company looks unusually profitable relative to the peers, then one needs to look at why that's happening. If you are evaluating a young company and this company has an unblemished record of meeting growth projections, that will be a concern because with a young company possibly in a young industry one would expect earnings and cash flows to be very volatile if that is not happening it might probably be because earnings are being managed management has adopted a minimalist approach to disclosure this would be a major cause for concern you might suspect that management is trying to hide some information Management fixation on earnings reports. If management is spending too much time on earnings reports and trying to ensure that analyst expectations are being met, then that would also be a cause for concern. One high level remark before we go to the conclusion. All the items that we have discussed on this slide and the previous slide are simply warning signs or signals Simply because you see that the gross margin is out of line doesn't mean that any manipulation or fraud is taking place. What you need to do is look at these signs holistically, look at whether there are multiple issues potentially taking place and then you really need to dig in deeper to understand why a certain activity is happening. So dig in deeper as to why the operating margin is out of line and then if you find something wrong 
can you conclude that potentially earnings management is taking place? So that is it in terms of this reading. Over the next few slides, I have simply reproduced the summary points from the curriculum. The points here are a recap of the whole reading and I would like you to read through these points because they capture the essence of the reading very well. This slide deals with the definition of reporting quality and the results quality then the distinction between aggressive accounting and conservative accounting. These are key points and these points are closely aligned with the learning outcomes defined at the start of the reading. This slide deals with the conditions that might lead to earnings management. So do managers have the motivation to manipulate earnings? Are the conditions conducive? So is there an opportunity to manipulate earnings? Is there rationalization? And then you need to understand the mechanisms that discipline financial reporting quality. You need to understand the concept of pro forma earnings and if you do see pro forma earnings you need to scrutinize the numbers extremely carefully and you also need to be particularly careful when you are comparing different companies that might be using their own pro forma statements. You need to be aware of the types of choices that management might have in reporting numbers you need to be aware of the most likely issues and all the major warning signs. So that is it. As always, I want you to practice a lot, go over the examples in the curriculum and then carefully do all the practice problems at the end of the reading.